Hello, I'm Matt Galloway, and this is The Current Podcast. If it feels like you are hearing a lot from the Prime Minister right now, you're not wrong. Over the past week, Justin Trudeau has been announcing millions for housing, billions for infrastructure, and a new national school food program. Yesterday, he came by our studio for a wide-ranging interview. Here's our conversation. Prime Minister, welcome back to The Current. Good to be back, Matt. Glad to have you here. It feels a bit like an election campaign. You're zipping across the country here and there, uh, announcing things with big dollar signs attached to them. Well, we got a big budget coming out, and it's one that's focused on the fact that far too many young people, particularly millennials and Gen Z, uh, don't feel like the system works for them anymore. Mm. Even if they have a great job, they are squeezed on housing, they're squeezed on rent, they can't save up for buying a home, they're pressed on groceries, they're seeing a world where climate change is getting worse and worse, they're worried about their future, and government has a role in making sure that there is fairness for them. Let me talk about that in a minute. Um, I want to begin with the news of the week in some ways, which is still the carbon tax. No matter what else you seem to speak about, people are focused on, on the price on carbon. We have seen an increase up to, what, $80 per tonne this week. A litre of gas now costs three cents more. Do you think you've made a convincing case to Canadians that that increase is a good thing? Well, I think we can put the case aside for a second and let's talk about the actual policy. The case matters because it people do, are protesting, wondering whether this of actually works Of course works the case matters, but let's make sure we're talking about the same thing. We designed a price on pollution in this country that gives more money back to average Canadians, to 8 out of 10 Canadian families, particularly middle-income and low-income people. So we're not only fighting climate change, we're putting more money in the pockets of folks who need it through the Canada Carbon Rebate. That's, that's the framework we built with all premiers working together back in 2016. Do you think you've made that case? Uh, I think we're continuing to make that case. It's understandable that at a time of anxiety, of pressure on costs, of affordability concerns, uh, that some politicians are trying to you know, drum up support for themselves by scaring people and by giving misinformation. It's unfortunate, but we're going to continue telling the truth, which is eight out of 10 families do better off because we put a price on pollution. So just to be clear, you don't think you've lost the narrative on this. We had a conversation this week with somebody who's a defender of the carbon tax. He talked about it as a dumpster fire in terms of how it's rolled out. You don't think you've lost the narrative on this? Well, I think what we've actually done in the policy, it is helping Canadians. Now, the fact that conservative premiers or, or the conservative leader of the opposition wants to take away those supports for Canadians, uh, that's something that people need to hear. And that's not something that they're talking about. So we're continuing to talk about the fact that they have no plan to fight climate change and no plan to keep supporting people with affordability. Of course, it's not just conservative premiers, though. It's Wab Canoe in uh, Manitoba. It's a fellow liberal in Andrew Fury in Newfoundland and Labrador. What would it take for them to convince you that this is not the right policy? Well, they have the opportunity to put forward a pricing frame that makes sure that pollution isn't free at the same level for the rest of the country, but in a way that works for their province if they don't want to have the federal backstop. Indeed, a number of provinces started with that. BC and Quebec still have it. Ontario actually only has the carbon tax because Doug Ford got rid of the cap and trade system. So as he rails against the price on pollution and the rebate we're giving to Ontario, he's actually responsible directly for it because he scrapped the Made in Ontario pricing plan they had. So Andrew Fury has said that he wants a meeting with you to talk about this. He wants the premiers to come together with you. Will you have that meeting? I had a meeting in 2016. Will with you have the, will you have the meeting now with? I will continue to talk with premiers, but I will continue to be pressing Andrew and all others on the actual facts that we have a plan to fight climate change that puts more money back in the pockets of Canadians that need it. And any premier or any conservative uh, leader of the opposition that wants to take away those checks that are helping eight out of 10 families right across the country is going to have to explain that both to me and to Canadians. One of the reasons why there's great anxiety over this is because, as you've said, there are a lot of people who feel like the system is stacked against them. Young people in particular, they do everything they can. They get a good job. They're working hard. They can't square that circle. You've had nine years in power. To what extent is your government responsible for the fact that that system is stacked against them? Uh, we got elected in 2015 
focused on supporting the middle class and we brought in a number of measures that made a huge difference. We cut child poverty in half in this country with the Canada Child Benefit. But particularly since the pandemic, we've seen things get so much more difficult for so many people, particularly the young people who've been my motivation since I got into politics 15 years ago. So investing in them, supporting them as renters, making sure there's a pathway for them to buy a home, making sure that they're confident that the world's not going to be on fire uh, when they're adults and raising their own kids so we fight climate change. These things matter. So do you take any responsibility? Does your government take any responsibility for the fact that people feel like the system is working against them, that they can't get ahead? I think ultimately the government is responsible for many, many things, good things and bad, and we wear that. And what we need to continue to do is respond to the pressures of the moment. What we've seen over the past few years is those pressures have increased everywhere around the world. And what Canada has done around uh, reducing childcare fees, saving thousands of dollars a month for families across the country, uh, coming forward just a few days ago with increases to a national school food program that is going to make a huge difference. And as a teacher, I know how much of a difference that makes. Accelerating the, the investments in housing, protections for renters, so that someone, a young person who's paying $2,000 in rent every single month diligently gets no credit for that, no kudos for that in their credit score. We should change that so that banks can look at them and say, oh, you are a reliable investment. We'll give you a mortgage so you can buy uh, a home as they become more affordable, as we increase supply. We are busy working on that. And yes, uh, there's things uh, that we we you know could have done more of early on had we known how bad this was going to be. We're doing it now you and we're accelerating. Had you known how bad it was going to be? I mean, there are a lot of these issues that have been hanging around for a long time. It has not been easy to buy a home, for example, in many parts of this country for years, not even at the pandemic, but long before that. Why didn't your government take more well, aggressive? Why didn't your t- government take more aggressive action on that earlier? Well, let's take an example. Uh, in 2017, two percent of our population were temporary immigrants, that is, temporary workers or foreign students. Right now, it's 7.5% of our population. That has caused millions of people here in this country putting pressure on a system beyond our regular immigration levels that has put pressure on housing, that has put pressure on the system in all ways. This is something we are doing to reduce that number down to 5% uh, over the coming year because we, years because we know that is something we can do. Now, Now, nobody could have predicted the pandemic. What we did during the pandemic was there to support people to get it through. People probably could have predicted that the number of temporary migrants coming to this country, I mean, if they were being tracked, that that was happening. The announcement that you're going to, you know, take it back under control, as you said earlier this week, is something that's only happening now. That's why people are wondering, I guess, why that more aggressive action wasn't taken earlier. Well, for example, aggressive action on temporary uh, on international students was something we had to do because provinces and institutions had exploded the numbers so rapidly that the federal government had to say, no, we're going to limit the number of international students because it's putting too many pressures on neighborhoods around. Now, that's something that, yes, the federal government is part of, but it's provinces that are the ones managing this that hadn't been willing to actually do their job, so we had to step in. So, yes... All of us working together need to be solving these things, and that's what I'm going to stay focused on. I mean, the end result of that is that there are a lot of young people in particular who voted for you in 2015 who have left the party, Mm -hmm. who are now openly talking about voting conservative. What do you say to them? What do you say to those people who feel like you let them down? I think about those young people a lot. What do you, so about, what do you say I to them? I think about the people who voted for me the, for the very first time they ever voted in 2015 uh, and who are now in their mid to late 20s and struggling. And that's why we're putting forward a focus on building for them, on making sure that their success is at the center of what we do, of restoring fairness for them in a system that, yes, has increasingly gotten stacked against them, not just you know, in Canada, but around the world. So that's where standing up for renters' rights, making sure we're building more supply of homes, making sure we're cutting childcare fees in half on the way down to $10 a day uh, for those young families, making sure we're moving forward on a sco- national food school program, making sure uh, we're expanding the infrastructure builds 
uh, that are going to build better public transit so people can live closer to the, the, the worlds they live in, uh, the place they work. Uh, moving forward on, on better competition mm. uh, in grocery uh, and transparency in grocery prices so that we can stabilize those prices. There's a lot of these different things to do at the same time as we're fighting climate change and building in the kinds of investments for the future. These are things that you can either sit back and say, okay, let me amplify the anger of young people or let me solve it. And I'm focused on solving it. But for people, again, who felt like you were the one who was going to answer those questions and they don't see those questions answered and they see Pierre Polyev and the Conservatives Sure, understanding that anger, tapping into that anger. What do you say to them who have left you to go to his party? Well, right now, Pierre Polyev and the Conservatives have exactly zero solutions to propose for any of these challenges. They are not putting forward an alternative. They are recognizing and amplifying the frustration and anger people are feeling. But they are not providing solutions in any way, shape, or form for climate change, for affordability. He wa- he's right now blocking the doubling of the rural top-up that helps, cons- uh, I was going to say it's conservative, but rural Canadians across the country uh, with a, a 20% uh, I- I- increase, uh, 20% top-up on the, on the uh, carbon, uh, Canada carbon rebate. They're blocking it in the House because of ideology. They're blocking money from going to people in rural communities who often vote for them because of their opposition and their desire to play politics. Yeah, their opposition to a price on pollution that fights climate change and puts more money in people's pockets. So I'm going to focus on delivering for people. That's what I got elected for. That's what I, the commitment I made. And we took a very different choice in 2015 than the United States did in responding to the challenges the middle class is facing. They voted for uh, a populist in Donald Trump, but Canadians voted for someone who's going to roll up their sleeves and deliver. And it is harder than ever before to do that. And that's why we're putting forward such an ambitious plan right now to change the equation for young people and for every generation. Do you think people are still listening to you or have they tuned you out? Uh, I think Canadians remain open-minded and ambitious about their future. People are hurting. People are worried. But when comes time to actually work for your community, work to build a better future, Canadians roll up their sleeves. And that's what they expect from their politicians as well. That's what we're doing. And uh, I look forward to the chance to talk with Canadians about that over the next year and a half. And in the next election, Canadians will have a really important choice to make about what kind of country we are. You're a factor in this, um, you personally. Mm. Why do you think people don't like you? (laughs) You know, I spend a lot of time talking with Canadians right across the country. I spent I spent uh, time this morning uh, with construction workers um, talking about the work that they were doing, building new rental units for Canadians uh, here in Toronto. Um, I think there is a lot of frustration with the way the world is unfolding and that frustration is being taken out on people in positions of power. I get that. That's part of my job. But my job is to stay focused on the solutions that people are going to need and that's what we're doing. But what about you? I mean, we're both old enough to have seen a number of prime ministers and I have never seen, I mean, the sticker that I saw yesterday in downtown Toronto running through the city with F. Trudeau on the back of a pickup truck. Mm -hmm. Flags with your name and the middle finger raised. Yeah. Why don't people like you? (laughs) There is a level of polarization and toxicity that we see in a very visible way on social media and also in real life, as you point out. But most Canadians remain thoughtful and open and decent and, yes, frustrated and worried about their future. But I also know Canadians are good people who are willing to work together to build that future, and I'm part of that. In the 2021 campaign, you used um, words talking about people framing them as anti-vaxxer mobs. You talked about their racist and misogynist agenda. Do you regret using language like that? Though? And re- do you think that that has added to how people think about you? I regret that when I was talking about specific groups of uh, racist, intolerant protesters, not everyone in the protest, but the ones who were shouting racial epithets and misogynistic slurs at my, uh, my, uh, my security detail and, and others, um, I'm going to call out intolerance and hateful language wherever it has. It is unfortunate that um, what I said was able to be that made a number of people feel I was talking about them. I have always been very, very careful to know people can be um, make own decisions about 
whether they get vaccinated or not, that there's normal vaccine hesitancy out there in every population. And our job as a, pol- as a government is to try and encourage people to do the right things for public health. The fact that the polarization and the toxicity was so amplified deliberately with misinformation and disinformation is something that is a larger question than just, you know, what I said on one particular day that was taken out of context. It's about whether Canadians are actually listening to each other and talking with each other and hearing each other and, and trying to remember that we are all in this together as, as citizens. I want to come back to that, that idea of whether we're talking to each other, whether we're listening to each other. But on the health care issue, I was reading this week Jane Philpott's book, your former health minister. She has a new book coming out about the health care system. And in it, she says, Canada's health care system is broken and that people are losing faith in it. Do you think Canada's health care system is broken? I think one of the problems is people are, are are proud of our healthcare system, but um, not sure that it's living up to its promise. Is it broken? I think there are parts of it that are absolutely broken. Like what? Um, the fact that we still don't aren't able to measure outcomes appropriately. The fact that we're still not able to uh, track improvements in one sector and apply them in other sectors. There's a huge problem with lack of good data around health and comparable data across the province. That's why when we, uh, across the provinces, when we stepped up with historic health investments of $200 billion last year, the core condition was that all healthcare systems across this country need to have transparent, rigorous data collection so we can actually measure the things that we need to improve. I think for people who are trying to interact with the healthcare system, they're not worried about data. They're worried about the fact that six and a half million of them can't find a family doctor. Well, I think that's a big piece of it as well. But if you're interacting with the healthcare system, you want to be able to interact in a way that is responding to you, that is seeing you. And better data, better health information is a piece of it. But part of our $200 million is directly towards increasing access to family doctors. That's one of our top priorities, and that's where we're signing deals with all the provinces on that. It was interesting. I was speaking with the Premier of Manitoba, Wab Canoe, in February, mm. just before you met with him, mm-hmm. and he said that it's going to take more than money. He said that we're spending more money than ever in healthcare, and the outcomes are getting worse. Yeah. This is something that we take great pride in as a nation. I agree. What is it going to take to get back to that pride? First, so that, to mm-hmm. Jane Philpott's point, people haven't lost faith and aren't losing faith in the system. Well, first of all... Um, getting a better understanding of what's working and what's not. We can't just throw money at the problem. I absolutely agree. That money needs to be spent in intelligent ways. And the best way to do that is to actually have accountability and transparency, not to the federal government by the provinces, but to citizens in the actual results pushing forward. And that's where the federal government is stepping in. We're not going to tell provinces how to deliver health care. The Constitution says they need to do that themselves. But we can make sure that they are measuring and demonstrating the improvements that Canadians deserve, including how many people are getting access to family doctors. I'm mindful of your time, so let me just ask you a few more things before I let you go. One is, I want to ask you about Israel and Gaza. Mm. A Canadian citizen, Jacob Flickinger, was killed this week in Gaza. He was delivering aid as part of the World uh, Kitchens Group. They had given their coordinates to the Israeli forces. They were still blown up on the ground. Benjamin Netanyahu said, it happens in war. We'll do everything so this thing does not happen again. The U.S. President Joe Biden said Israel hasn't done enough to protect aid workers. You've been calling for accountability. What does accountability actually look like in something like this? Well, first of all, we need to find out exactly what went wrong on this, how the IDF was so mistaken as to kill uh, aid workers like this. It's absolutely unacceptable. But it underscores the need for a ceasefire. Now, we need Hamas to lay down its arms. We need it to release all hostages. But we also need humanitarian aid to get in to the level that is necessary. Before October 7th, there were about 500 trucks a day going into Gaza. Now there's barely 100 a day at a time where they need 800 or 1,000 trucks a day. But what does accountability look like? Accountability means the structures involved, whoever launched that missile and whoever ordered that launch and didn't have the checks and balances in place to prevent uh, a 
identified aid convoy that is there to help against the ongoing famine that's starting in, in Gaza. This never should have happened. This never should have happened from uh, a, a, a country that is a rule of law country like, uh, like Israel. And that means there needs to be accountability. This war has created real tension in this country. Mm-hmm. Um, and you were talking earlier about the need for civility. There was this open letter calling for civility in this country and, and a way for people to talk to each other. Mm. What do you think we've lost in the absence of that, in the absence of, of what people see as civility in politics and beyond? I think Canada has always done well. We do differences in diversity better than just about any other country in the world, not because we've been perfect, but because we have acknowledged our mistakes from the Kamagata Maru to the St. Louis to other uh, internment uh, of, uh, of Japanese citizens and else. Um, we know we need to do better. And part of doing better is listening to each other and being there for each other. And unfortunately, the polarization of politics, the impact of social media and everyone's little bubbles they fall into uh, has us forget to remember our neighbors and forget to engage with them as people with feelings that may be different from yours, but are no less legitimate than yours. We need to start talking and listening to each other again. We need to start working together to build stronger communities. And uh, we need to be there for each other like Canadians have in the past. I have to let you go. But um, you told our colleagues at Radio Canada that you often think about, these are your words, quitting this crazy job. Are you serious? Uh, I actually said job de malade, um, which is a slight, slight different. It's a a job for crazy people. Job for well, six of one half, doesn't it? The other perhaps, but yes. Well, perhaps. Um, Listen, you can't do this job without needing to regularly check that you still have the fire to do it and the drive to do it. And when you look at family sacrifices, when you look at personal sacrifices, it's normal to have those reflections every now and then. But the fact is, this is a time where leadership matters, where responsible leadership matters that pulls Canadians together and puts forward the solutions people need in their lives. And that's entirely what I'm focused on. Prime Minister, thank you very much. Always a pleasure, Matt. My conversation with the Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, was recorded yesterday in our Toronto studio.